Hi, I'm Larry Reed, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart, and today I actually have two guests who are the creators of a new podcast I'd like you to know about. Revived Thoughts is a podcast that takes sermons by famous preachers like Charles Spurgeon, B.B. Warfield, John Calvin, many more, and they recreate them in modern language. And they also give some backstory of the preacher as well as the context that that particular sermon was preached in. So I have two guys, Troy Frazier and Joel Bordas, and uh, Troy is a children's pastor at Northside Christian Church in Kansas City. Troy has worked as a Bible and science teacher in a school in downtown Miami after being a teacher at a Christian school in Shenyang, China. Joel Bordas is a missions videographer for Biblical Ministries Worldwide. He visits missionaries on the field and helps them share their story and how they are spreading the gospel in their regions. Guys, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. So, um, Troy, I'm going to have you just kind of tell us a little bit about your podcast and just when was it launched and what were some of the goals that you had? Yeah, no problem. We launched in the first week of May, and our goals were to just take these old sermons, sermons that were preached hundreds of years ago, way before audio, and basically bring them back to life. You know, before we had radio and audio and all of that, uh, a lot of times these sermons would get passed around from church to church and people would listen to, would read them and they would know what these other uh, people were saying. But once, you know, radio got invented, audio recordings, all those old sermons that were being written down and read before kind of got left on the bookshelf and forgotten. And yet there's this really important part of our theology. You know, people read books by Charles Spurgeon, they read books by John Calvin, they care so much about what these guys wrote down, but almost it's very rarely studied the actual sermons that they did. So our goal was to try to bring them back to life. And better than reading them is to, you know, listen to them, hear them, actually feel like you're hearing them for the first time because sermons are better to listen to. You could you can pick up a script of a movie or a play and read it, and that's fine. But if you can watch the movie, if you can watch the play, it's going to hit you, I think, a lot stronger. And that was our opinion with these sermons too. So how long ago, let's say you launched in May, so how long ago did you like think, hey, we need to do this? <laughs> this goes back uh, quite a bit of a ways. Uh, you know, Charlie and I met in Bible college in 2011 at Calvary Bible College uh, in Kansas City, and we became great friends, and we stayed in contact through the years, and it was probably, what, 2017, 2018? Yeah, it was uh, Troy, 2017. Troy was in China, uh, and, and we were chatting one day, and he says, you know, you know it would be a really neat idea for a podcast if we were to take these old manuscripts, these old sermons uh, from these, these great men of God that, you know, uh, modern generations have all but forgotten about because it's not very accessible. You know, a ton of people listen to podcasts today. Uh, I'm subscribed to, to several different podcast feeds of, of sermons, you know, coming out of different churches, different pastors. But we have these sermons from hundreds of years ago that, that we don't really think about a whole lot anymore. And, they're, and yet they're, they're incredibly applicable you know, the word of God is timeless in so many different ways. So yeah, it was, it was probably around 2017. So I said, this would be a neat idea. Um, and I said, you're absolutely right. That, that'd be, that'd be a great project. And it, and it, it took off from there. But we had no idea. The reason it took from 2017 till 2019 to launch us, we had no idea. It just, it sounded like, oh, this will be pretty easy. And then as we got started from choosing the sermons, editing the sermons, because we very quickly realized nobody wants to listen to something that sounds like it's pre-King James English. Um, so editing that, bringing these sermons to life, it took a long time to get a good sounding show that we thought people would actually be interested and engaged with and yet would still do justice to the work. And when we finally got that combination, got people ready to preach, we then decided to launch that in May and it's been doing well. Awesome. Yeah, it's uh doing doing a podcast takes a lot of planning as I've as I've learned in the past two years. <laughs> it uh it's it's little harder than you might expect. Although yeah. every, you know every now and then things become easy on a particular episode and it just kind of flows and so forth. But so do you plan to do this with like a, a seasonal approach where like you release a bunch for a few months and then take a break? Or do you kind of, you're going to have a regular schedule that you hope that you'll keep up? 
So right now, every Thursday, there's a brand new episode of Revive Thoughts that people can listen to with a new sermon. The goal is for this to be a seasonal thing. We uh, we launched with about 10 episodes ready to go. So we're like, okay, this will be our first season. When we finish this, we'll kind of uh, recover and figure out what needs to be tweaked. However, we've been receiving very positive feedback and we've been receiving sermons from people, from listeners who like the show and want to get involved with it. And they've been doing them for us. So we actually now have quite a few episodes beyond what our original season was planning. So we're just going to go and go ahead and do it as it's going, as God continues to bring more people on board who want to work with us. We're just going to kind of run that season out until um, it's time to, you know, to take that break. But yeah, we, we have so many people right now working on them. There's no reason to stop. So what's the format of your podcast? I mean, you know, with this podcast that we do, it's a lot of question and answer and a little bit of conversation depending on the episode. And sometimes it's a lot of discussion and so every now and then it's a little bit of a debate between, you know, me and someone else or whatever. But other podcasts have different formats. You introduce it and then you, and one of you reads it. So tell us a little bit about like, what can listeners expect if they haven't heard it already? Yeah, great question. Um, So these these sermons were were preached in different eras, in different two different audiences, um, in different parts of the world, and so uh, we find that uh, it's it's really interesting and really helpful to have a bit of backstory, have a bit of uh, history context. And so we spend the first, usually around roughly ten minutes of each episode, kind of talking through the history of the subject that that preached that week's sermon, um, a bit about their past, their upbringing. If there's something specific to the context of that sermon, it really helps listeners kind of relate and engage and and kind of get in the mindset of an audience member that would have heard that sermon for the first time as that person in history would have been preaching it. Yeah, if I can add a little, um, you know, if I tell you we have a sermon about overcoming fear and it's a good sermon, the sermons themselves are pretty good. You'll go, oh, that's a, you know, it's a good sermon. If I tell you it was preached by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, and he's the martyr who went and, you know, died. And he, he went back to Germany two different times after being kicked out, knowing what was going to happen. That adds another layer. This isn't somebody who just said overcome fear. This is somebody who lived out and, you know, he lived a life of overcoming fear. And then if I tell you that this sermon was preached the week after a thousand or more Nazis marched through the streets with torches, declaring, we want Hitler to be the new chancellor of Germany. You know, we want him in power and they get in this brawl with communists on the streets and that all happens. And then that Sunday people show up for church and Dietrich Bonhoeffer goes, goes, don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Suddenly that sermon, I feel like has a lot more context. It has a lot more weight behind it. Yeah. And every sermon that we do is recorded by a different person. Troy and I do the intro and we talk a bit about the history, um, but the sermon itself that we will transition into has a unique voice. And that's something that's been a lot of fun is, is to see a lot of people want to be on board and want to be the voice of some of these people in history. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's real neat to see. So, so am I going to hear like German accents? You are not going to hear German <laughs> accents. Um, some of these sermons are so old, I wouldn't even know what the accents sound like. And right, also, right. we can only imagine that would go terribly if that was attempted. So, <laughs> um, that was we. And you're not the first person to ask that question. The very first person we sent that Dietrich Bonhoeffer sermon to, he's like, "So do I need to do it in German or what?" And we're like, "No, it's okay. They'll have to forgive that one area." <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you can creatively retell a lot of things, but some things yeah. you, you know, you just want to, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, watch a movie in America that's set in Germany in World War II. Like, yeah. they, depending on the genre and the way they've decided to do their movie, sometimes it's German with subtitles in English yeah. and sometimes it's just English, exactly. you know, and that's what you hear. So it's totally, totally acceptable. Uh, is is it a dramatic reading? Like, I, I do audiobooks a lot and there's like these dramatized versions of books that are completely from the book. They're not like retellings, but is it dramatic reading or is it just like as someone is up there preaching a sermon? So yeah, it's more as if someone is preaching the sermon. The goal is like for you to almost be immersed as if, okay, I feel like I'm in Sunday. You know, if I close my eyes, let me listen. I'm going to feel like I'm in church just hearing it from the pulpit. Uh, Now there are some people who have put on a little more of a dramatic spin to it. What we really didn't want it to be was just reading the sermons. You know, that's great for those who want to listen to that. But we really didn't want to just feel like dry text being read. We really wanted that, you know, that feeling as if you are actually in church, you can almost feel it for a moment. So Troy, when you sent me the the description for the podcast to kind of read to our listeners, you use the phrase, you recreate them in modern language, these sermons. What does that even mean? Is this just like removing the these and thous? 
So it's definitely removing the these, thous, thighs, all that. Um, there's also portions of some of the sermons that as much as we'd love to keep them, they just don't apply anymore. They'll, they'll say things that are just so like out of text, out of date, don't make any sense that we do. It, it, it's more of a hassle for the listener to have to try to figure out what that meant. Then, you know, we don't want people pulling out commentaries to listen to these things. Um, and then there's a lot of words. It's not just these thousand thighs. Like there's a lot of big, interesting words that are really great when you read them in a book, but when you hear them and you have no idea what they mean, it's just a hassle. And also for our poor speakers, you know, these people are volunteering, giving up their time to bring these sermons to life. We don't really want them to just spend the whole time having to pull out a, a synonym finder and trying to figure out what all these things mean. Also, some of these sermons are long. We had to take one sermon that was filled with just great information, but it was all historical context that meant nothing to the listener. And we had to cut it down to about a third of its size. So there was a lot of stuff like that. I mean, it was 40 pages got cut out of one. Oh, wow. 40 pages? Yes. And that one, that's, that's a pretty long one. That sermon still went on to be about a 20, I mean, at least a 30 minute sermon. So it was, I mean, there's some yeah. of these things have to be clipped quite a bit. Yeah. Do you know, you know, I meant to ask you this a few minutes ago. Did, do you know if these people, these preachers reread their sermons to different audiences more than once? I know like pastors preach like the same sermon with a different yeah. outline and they kind of adjust. So it depends on the pastor. For example, we have one sermon that we're working on getting created into an episode where he is actually literally responding on the spot to someone in his, con- like he had a speaker come, found out he was a universalist preaching, everyone goes to heaven. He goes to his church, listens, and they're like, would you like to say something? And that sermon that he gives is an on the spot, like response, basically. So there's one like that. Um, but then there are sermons that we're pretty sure were preached. You know, they were preached multiple times. They went around kind of giving the same sermon in different co- revivalist preachers sometimes did that. Um, so this certainly is. But then again, there's some like Bonhoeffer where that sermon overcoming fear was for that week, for that moment. So, OK, so now back to the present question that I asked you, <laughs> what, what, were the, what are some of these big words that like people use? Like, I would want to know whether or not you are uh, dummying down the language too much. Like, I can imagine some listeners being like, well, I don't want them to like totally modernize everything. So like, what are some words that, that you might have examples for? I mean, because obviously certain contexts might be really important. Yeah, so some of these words are just hard to say. They they make it, it's harder on the speakers, it's harder on the listener to, and if you hear too many of these really technical terms that made sense a long time ago that don't really make as much sense today, you can kind of get distracted listening to those words and then you just completely miss the point of the sermon. And so we didn't mm. want that to happen too. And then there was also context and phrases and things that just don't sound as good to modern ears. I specifically had a sermon the other day where he just is a great sermon, but in the middle of it, he just goes, you know, it's kind of like when you get a slave and they're not very grateful or something like that. And you're just like, oh, I mean, hmm, don't really want to put this in here, put this out for everyone. It's, it's, you know, it's definitely context and it's not going to go over well. And it's going to put people in a place where now they're thinking about this guy and slave owner and all this stuff. And it, it, you're going to lose the point about God because of something like that, I think. Does reading stuff like that when you're doing your research make you think differently about the preacher? Yeah, it does to a degree because you go, oh, wow, um, didn't suspect that. Now, I'll say the slave thing was actually has only happened once. And that's that one actually surprised. I was reading. I looked up at my uh, wife. I was like, hey, check this out. I wasn't expecting that. For the most part, though, when we do our research on these people, it's actually the opposite. It happens where the more I read it, the more I look at them, the more I'm like, oh, my gosh, wow, these guys were incredible. There is mm-hmm. so much wisdom and knowledge here that I didn't I didn't see coming. That's usually the direction it goes. There's only one time where I had that where I was like, oh, that's not a comfortable to put up there for anybody. Yeah. Hey, podcast listeners. Since you like listening to audio content, we wanted to let you know about a new audiobook titled Called to Freedom, Why You Can Be Christian and Libertarian. It's read by me, Jacqueline Isaacs, one of the contributing authors of the book, and every download helps to support the Libertarian Christian Institute. To learn more and to download the audiobook today, go to calltofreedombook.com. So I can imagine our listeners, we're about like halfway through this episode and we haven't really talked about anybody specifically. So yeah. um, let's let's kind of transition to that. And just what are some of the one episodes or just even ones that are forthcoming, you know, some people that you think a libertarian audience might appreciate knowing, you know, about, about their sermons or, you know, whatever. So 
for one episode, I think pretty much anybody in a Christian, like this libertarian audience, needs to check out is a guy named Samuel Cooper. We did him a few weeks ago. We're going to probably repost about him a lot because he is a founding father preacher. And what I mean by that was he was literally preaching right through the Revolutionary War. In his congregation was John Adams, John Quincy Adams, the two presidents. He had John Hancock in his congregation. He had, I mean, these big players that helped set up the United States of America in his congregation. And that's one thing we learned and studied too is, you know, there's a lot of talk, oh, is America a Christian nation, this or that. There's definitely one thing that's completely forgotten is the role that pastors and sermons played on history and shaping these people, what these people would turn out to think. And uh, Samuel Cooper is asked to give an address at the beginning of Massachusetts, like they're putting out their uh, constitution and they want him to preach the sermon that will go. And this sermon gets read by pretty much everyone afterwards. Um, And his sermon is basically putting out the vision of what America can be, what America will be like at her best. And it's really interesting to see what they were thinking, what the what what the idea behind it was. And there's even weird historical tidbits. Like he quotes some people in British Parliament who are defending the Americans, saying, no, they have the right to rebel against us. We should they should do that. It's just it's a really fascinating. If you like history and you're into that kind of thing at all and or politics, that's a sermon you really need to hear. In today's age of like constant bickering back and forth, I think he has a really interesting and unique take on it. Yeah, I mean you mentioned history there. And I I, I do love in some ways, I mean, this podcast is also a history podcast because we do cover a lot of, of history, not as much as, as we'd like sometimes because we do need to save time for the sermon, but there, there are usually incredible historical roots for, for these sermons um, that I, I, I personally love. Um, everything from, you know, Charles Spurgeon to Hudson Taylor, George Mueller, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, the history behind these people is very fascinating, uh, and it's one of my favorite parts about doing this show is uh, just learning more about the history of these believers. Um, another example, too. So when I was a teacher, I asked my kids one time, this was last year, I said, you know, who do you, who's a Christian hero you look up to? And they they uh, gave not great answers. Now, the school I worked at was great. They did the best they could. But, you know, some of these kids, their answers were were Martin Luther King. Okay, cool. And then there were people like Gandhi, and there were people like Malcolm X, and people uh, who are explicitly not Christians at all. And they're giving them as their Christian role models and heroes. And even though that was just this, you know, a group of, a small group of kids in middle school, I think that's kind of true of a much larger group of Christians where we may know theology, we may know a lot of the right answers, or we may know pastors today, and we may have a ton of people we're listening to right now in sermons. When it comes to actual real heroes and models and people like we're trying to guide our life off of, very, I think it's very hard for people to think of anybody. Yet these people have truly incredible lives. They went through things that I... Hudson Taylor lost four of his kids while he was on the missionary field, and he married a wife, she died, married another wife, she died. I mean, he had a hard life. George Mueller outlasted his entire family, all his kids and his family. He he lived out outlived all of them pretty much as by himself by the end of his days. I mean, these guys did these things. And yet then when you look at their sermons and hear how they talk about God, you're like, wow, you're not bitter, you're not sad. You are you 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 seem to experience God in a way that I just I'm blown away by. What was, you know, you've mentioned Bonhoeffer and John Calvin. That's a pretty wide range. Like what's the oldest sermon you've worked on so far? Yeah, so far this this season, and we'll probably go older than this, but so far I believe the oldest sermon uh, is a tie between John Calvin and John Bradford uh, in the 1500s there. Uh, but our plans are to eventually try to cover the whole scope of history. It's just as you get further back, it takes more work to make the sermon kind of jive with natural. Mm-hmm. We did record some really ermine se- sermons and the uh, We then kind of went back and we're like, we're not ready yet. We're going to get there. It's definitely Mm -hmm. in the plans. But when we listen to them, we're like, this just doesn't sound right yet. Uh, What about your newest? Our newest would definitely be Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Do you plan to go anything newer than that? Not really. I mean... Yes. Oh, oh. Okay, so there are some sermons, and uh, there's a there's a couple pastors in China and other places where they are a little bit older, but they didn't get recorded due to their own conditions on the ground. So, it, 1950s, I think, is one sure. that I want to work with. Sure. Yeah. Outside of that, though, if it's been recorded, we really don't mess a whole round with it a whole lot because at right. that point, you can you can go get it, you can go find it yourself. Our goal is not to re-record sermons that you can still listen to. In fact, it's probably better to listen to that original speaker if you still can. Yeah. Well, and also, like, even if it wasn't recorded, but it was written down, 
it's it doesn't necessarily need to be done in modern language like it's not yeah. inaccessible exactly even even in written form and you're trying to make this thing you're you're trying to make it accessible for people who probably i mean honestly i would not go back and read these like yeah. if someone said to me hey like if someone with the passion that you have for these sermons had just emailed me and said, hey, Doug, I really think that you should read these sermons. They've really impacted my spiritual walk with God, and they've really made me think about politics a little bit differently. They've made me think about my faith differently. I, I Honestly, I wouldn't read them. But and, you, you tell me a podcast, I'm like, oh, because I like listening to sermons. That's that's cool. <laughs> I can listen to that again. Well, and that's something, too. Like People, I'll, I'll, I mean, goodness gracious, look at some of the top podcasts, and you're going to find some Joel Osteen. Some of these guys have millions and millions and millions of listeners. But... All these podcasts, they live in the same area, same era, same time. They're all kind of saying, not maybe the same thing. Surely they're all over the place theologically. But there's very similar language, similar thoughts. They've gone through similar experiences. They grew up, a lot of them, honestly, in the West somewhere. And so there's very much a kind of a commonality, which means they still approach things with kind of one lens. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there can be kind of an echo chamber effect sometimes caused by that. And that's not bad. It keeps some things like everyone, when they use the word disciple, we're kind of all on the same page. We know what's, some of that's good. But at the same time, our faith is old. And our, our I mean, we only have 100 years recorded. There's 19, There's 1,800 years that didn't get recorded at least, you know? And I really think that when you when you study these guys, you listen to these sermons, you realize how consistent these sermons sound throughout history. I mean, my goodness, you could take some of these sermons, change the language, give it to a preacher down the road, and you wouldn't even realize that this is, you know what I'm saying? Like there's still that same approach to God when you kind of look at how consistent our faith is over 1800 years. And then you go, wow, like there's, they have different perspectives, but we're still talking about the same God of the Bible. I think that's really cool. So do you have some sort of vetting process whereby you, you know, <laughs> you're laughing already because I'm asking this question, but like you are like, okay, well, we're not going to do this sermon because, you know, we don't believe in, that what he's saying is truly biblical or is it, do you try to be ecumenical? Like how, or I should say, how ecumenical are you going to try to be? Because, you know, you mentioned the universalist preacher and you were talking about the other guy's response to it. Like where, where do you draw the line and like, ah, eh, we're not going to do this or we'll just push it down the road a bit, you know, maybe someday. That's really tough. Uh, may, okay. So, and that's one thing too. We'll take sermons by people that we're not necessarily endorsing these people, but we'll take the sermon. So we went to Bible college. We try to stick with anything that if the sermon is just so off base that it just doesn't seem to jive with the Bible, God, you know, they're not really talking about a Trinity, things that really basic beliefs of Christ, we're probably not going to mm-hmm. stick with it. And I've had to do that where I'm just like, yeah, I just, I don't think the sermon is even remotely. The further back in history or the more interesting the person is, the more I start to be a little more generous to them. For example, there's a a guy who I, or a sermon I'm working with where he is, um, he's a priest in Germany during the Black Plague. Uh, he's obviously not going to jive a whole lot with mainstream Christianity today. A lot of his beliefs are kind of out there, but I found a sermon that I think there's nothing nothing wrong with it. It approaches God in a great way, and he's an interesting guy. Now, would I say go read all of his works? No, I don't know that I would say that at all. But this sermon he preached is it's edifying to the Lord. You can learn from it. And some of these things too, we put out there, we say, you know, we don't necessarily, we will even say it in the episode. We're not saying that we 100% agree with everything this sermon or this guy is saying out there. But what we are saying is that we think this is a really interesting perspective that Christians maybe need to hear. But we, we really, it's a, that's honestly a tough line is, you know, where do we draw that line? Um, yeah, expe- I mean, you, you say it's a tough line and it is, especially, you, you know, we have our, our viewpoint here as Americans in the West, you know, in, in modern day, era. uh, And we have a lot of different denominations. We have a lot of different ways of categorizing what we believe and how we break down our theology. And the further back you go, the less defined that becomes, especially, I mean, once you get Mm -hmm. pre-Reformation, pretty much, I mean, there's nothing in the West today that is kind of in lines with what we see pre-Reformation. And so the further back you go, the more theology is different than how we define it today. And even some of these guys that are even just as recent as Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer is a pretty amazing guy. His books have been well read by evangelicals, Protestants. And at the same time, if he had not died, if his, you know, he hadn't lived through Nazi Germany, I don't know that a whole lot of people, mainline Christianity probably wouldn't have gone to his church. He was a Lutheran, you know, that would have, so it's kind of like, where do you, 
you know, we'll tell you up front who this guy is. You can make your decision based on whether or not that that's going to be something we think will pull you away from him. Uh, one sermon we did was by Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift, most people didn't even realize he was a Christian. He uh, is a satire writer. He wrote, you know, Gulliver's Travels, A Modest Proposal, and he preaches a sermon on the wisdom of the world. I think it's a really great sermon, and yet I don't necessarily agree with every point that he makes in it. And he's an Anglican, I believe. Do you have themes that you go over? Like, you know, this this month or this season, we plan to cover, you know, a particular theme that that people might want to be interested in and like just sample from sermons that that touch on that theme. Or do you just kind of go for they, they kind of all an independent episode, each one of them? Yeah, I mean, but most of what we do are our standalone episodes. We haven't done anything with a week to week theme. And, and that's because we do want these episodes to kind of to be isolated in in time, you know, they they don't have anything with current events or anything like that. So you can go back in our feed and in our catalog and pick out any one random episode uh, and still get the full intent of that episode. You don't have to listen to other ones. If if you see a speaker in the feed that you like or that you um, have been curious about hearing what the you know what their sermons are like, um, you can jump into that episode and listen to that as a self contained episode without having to worry about missing out on on other context. Now, one theme I would say that has come out that Joel and I have noticed, and we didn't even realize it while we were putting it together, but as we recorded them, we couldn't help but notice it, is that there's two, I think, two really big themes um, in all of these preachers' lives that we've noticed almost almost across the board. The first would be suffering. All of these guys had incredibly hard and sad lives, especially like the the more meaningful the name is probably the more he had going on that was really tough, whether it was losing loved ones, whether it was like living through war or being a martyr, whatever it was, they had incredibly challenging lives, which again, just makes their sermons stand out all the more as they praise God with such high words. And then the other one I would argue is that they all worked very hard. The number of these guys it is shocking that died young. And it's pretty much like the doctors can pretty much straight up say, yeah, this guy worked himself to death. I would say at this point, at least a third, maybe half of the preachers died probably 20 to 30 years younger than they would have if they had just slowed down. But they, they, I mean, John Calvin, when asked, you know, why are you going so much that we can't even hear your voice anymore? You know, you need to slow down and take a break. And he was just basically, uh, yeah, and be found idle when Jesus comes back. No, no, I'm going to go all the way. And that's, I mean, that just happened over and over again with these guys. So there is the themes that like, the more you listen to them, you'll pick up on like, wow, there's like certain things that make these, the reason we know these men today, there's certain little attributes like that, that kind of stand out. So I want to hear from each of you, just give me like, what's your favorite story or thing you learned or just like something exciting that you love to share about something you learned in this podcast, not just about your podcast, but like about a person or about the sermon or something like that. Troy, why don't you start? No problem. Uh, this one's easy for me. I mean, there's so many good. I could, oh, I could go on all day. Uh, Hudson Taylor is my guy. The, uh, so I always have kind of been a fan of his. I lived in China for a couple of years, you know, working at a Christian school. He went to China. So we got that in common. And I actually lived in Hangzhou for a year. His headquarters was Hangzhou. So, you know, uh, but what really blew my mind, I did not realize this, was he moved to China in 1860 at the very beginning of the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion is the fourth bloodiest event in human history. It is the bloodiest thing that happened in the 1800s. It beats the French Revolution. It is this horrifying event that started because this man decided he basically he was the brother of Jesus Christ and that he was going to start a cult and that this cult was going to try to take over China. And before this thing is over, I mean, we're talking tens of millions of people have gone to war. Um, Britain, France, and like these different nations have to come in and help China resettle everything. And that's the environment where this guy's running around saying, I'm the brother of Jesus Christ, that Hudson Taylor lands and has to be a missionary in. The first 15 years, he's in the exact same region this war is going on. He actually sends a cannonball back to his mom. And he's like, hey, and that cannonball still is in the family today. He's like, hey, mom, this almost took my head off while I was preaching the other day. So that's fun. I mean, like he's literally in a war zone. He's there for 15 years. I cannot imagine what that was like to go through. And yeah, he sits there. He's faithful. And by the end of his life, I mean, China's Christian movement today can really be traced back to Hudson Taylor's faithfulness. But I just can't imagine what it was like to get there and hear Jesus's brothers running around. He started a war and it's going to be 15 years. I mean, this the same exact time as our civil war. And it's like 10 times the number of deaths easily. I heard a lot about Hudson Taylor as a kid, but no, I didn't know that. Joel, what's your favorite? Troy was talking about, you know, Hudson Taylor's faithfulness, and that's obviously a, a huge theme you see uh, a lot with these people. Um, George Mueller was one that really struck them out. He, he's, he's a man that has tremendous faith. He, he 
uh, kind of revolutionized people's attitudes towards orphans um, in London during the 1800s and is really responsible for orphanages as, as a whole being a, a respected establishment. It, just to hear, and we kind of go into a few accounts and stories of his life, um, but the man had 100% absolute faith that God would provide. And there are accounts after accounts where um, he had nothing and there were hundreds of kids to take care of and he didn't even sweat. Like that that was normal. And he just had faith that God would provide. And time and time again, uh, the Lord provides food. The Lord provides care, clothing, education um, out of nowhere. And it is it is incredible to see how the Lord rewards people with great faith. Uh, we also have an episode coming up in the next couple of weeks on D.L. Moody. And um, I think it's probably going to be one of my favorite episodes when we get it out. Uh, it's it's a very interesting story. He's a very interesting man with with a lot of history and a lot of interesting facts to his past. But uh, the sermon that that we're doing is on, uh, he, he preaches about temptation. He, and he talks about all these examples from the 1800s that could cause temptation in that era. And it's interesting to see how there's almost an exact modern day counterpart to uh, these these examples that he's pointing out in the 1800s. And I find it real fascinating. We also have a uh, uh, an audio recording of D.L. Moody speaking. Uh, and he died in the 1800s, so that's incredibly rare. And it's a very, very scratchy recording. You can barely make out the words he's saying, but it is neat to to hear what he actually spoke like and, you know, the cadence of his voice and and how it came across to the people. Uh, it's not like, you know, we, we, we hear sermons today at all. So your podcast is named Revive Thoughts. So I'm sure people can look at it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and some other places. But do you have a website? How would listeners find you to get more information about all of this? Yeah, if you like what you're hearing, go to revivethoughts.com. And also you can find us, of course, on iTunes, of course, on Podcast Addict, any kind of podcast player of choice, we are definitely there. And, you know, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram, we have all that. So if you want to connect more with the show, and I always say this, if you would like to, if you're hearing this and going, you know, I think I could do a sermon, feel free to contact us at revivethoughts at gmail.com. We'd be more than happy to have your voice and add you to our talented pool of guest speakers there. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you for introducing to our listeners this whole concept. I mean, it's just a fascinating idea. And I. it sounds like you guys are both learning a lot. And I can imagine the feedback you've gotten from listeners to like, oh, wow, this is this makes it so much more accessible. So I'm imagining you're, you're impacting lives for Christ yep. and working for the kingdom in that way, too. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And thank you so much for having us on the show. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Thank you.